wonderful it is to be with you this morning, both here and on campus and those of you joining us via Zoom. Welcome to chapel service at Bethany Theological Seminary. My name is David Wakeley and I'm an ESR student enrolled in the Master of Arts in Peace and Social Transformation program. As many of you know, the theme for the fall chapel service here at Bethany is active pacifism. And today we'll hear a sermon from our guest preacher, Steve Schweitzer, who is academic dean and professor here at Bethany on the nature of servant, 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 servanthood, <laughs> excuse me, and forgiveness. We'd also like to please welcome our guest musician and pianist, Nancy Faust Mullen, who is Professor Emerita of Music and Preaching here at Bethany. We're delighted to have her. And I'd also like to invite you to greet warmly your neighbors on this beautiful fall morning. Thank you, everyone. So as you are able, please stand and join me in a call to worship. Your unwavering love, O oh Lord, knows no limits. How wonderful is your unwavering love, O oh God? You are the eternal source of life. Soften our will to join yours, O God, that we may bring healing to this world. Thank you. And if you would, please remain standing and open your hymnal to number 414 and hum along to verses 1 and 3. Thank you, everyone. Please have a seat. This morning, there are two scripture readings for us to reflect on. The first comes from Matthew chapter 12, verses 15 through 21. And here in the scripture, just prior to our reading, Jesus has just left the synagogue on Sabbath after healing a man with a withered hand, which according to covenantal law is work and therefore forbidden. 
and the Pharisees have begun to plot against him. This is the gospel according to Matthew. Aware of this, Jesus withdrew from that place, and a large crowd followed him, and he healed all who were ill. He warned them not to tell others about him. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I've chosen, the one I love in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not, he will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out, till he has brought justice through to victory. In his name the nations will put their hope. This is the word of the gospel. Thanks, Peter. And now from Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 7. Here is my servant whom I uphold my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a dimly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be crushed until he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his teaching. Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people upon it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord, I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you by the hand and kept you. I have given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. Hear the words of the prophet. You stand alone, us. You're the one who should be afraid, ever. You just want cruelty to beget cruelty. You're not superior to people who were cruel to you. You're just a whole bunch of new cruel people. A whole bunch of new cruel people being cruel to some other people who'll end up being cruel to you. The only way anyone can live in peace is if they're prepared to forgive. Why don't you break the cycle? I started it. I will not stop it. You think they'll let me go after what I've done? You're all the same, you screaming kids. You know that? Look at me. I'm unforgivable. Well, here's the unforeseeable. I forgive you after all you've done. I forgive you. <sighs> Winning? Is that what you think it's about? I'm not trying to win. I'm not doing this because I want to beat someone, or because I hate someone, or because, because I want to blame someone. It's not because it's fun. God knows it's not because it's easy. It's not even because it works, because it hardly ever does. I do what I do because it's right, because it's decent. And above all, it's kind. It's just that. Just kind. Never be cruel, never be cowardly. Remember, hate is always foolish, love is always wise. Always try to be nice and never fail to be kind. Laugh hard. Run fast. Be 
be kind. Good morning. It's my pleasure today to bring you the sermon as the final scheduled message on the designated topic of active pacifism in Bethany's fall faculty sermon series. Each year, the student leadership team does a great job of picking out themes, and I'm always struck by the various approaches, text, insights that faculty bring forward in their sermons, and this year has been no exception. I trust that the word today will contribute to this ongoing conversation concerning active pacifism as I bring the science fiction series of Doctor Who, which you saw a couple of clips of, into conversation with the Bible in hopes of illuminating a topic that can often feel theoretical, but should be immensely practical in our lives. In recent years, I've noticed how particular texts keep coming back around like old friends, making a much needed and much valued visit. Passages of scripture that meant something years ago make a new appearance, sometimes with the same or similar main point of connection, and sometimes with new insights or appreciation because we are experiencing them as new people, as different people than we used to be when we first encountered them. And both of these are the case for me today in revisiting these texts from Isaiah 42 and Matthew 12. These biblical texts for our time together this morning are of course connected. Matthew cites the Isaiah passage in association with the healing ministry of Jesus. The gospel writer informs readers to the reader that many crowds followed Jesus who cured them all, fulfilling what the prophet Isaiah had written centuries prior. In Matthew, the context of this link between the Hebrew Bible prophecy and Jesus's ministry is a series of conflicts between Jesus and the Pharisees in which healing and specifically healing on the Sabbath is the source of their friction. Jesus has been providing physical healings to the crowds, drawing attention, and he orders them to not make him known. Of course, many ignore this, and his fame spreads because of the miraculous deeds that are being done to restore hurting and suffering people. Matthew interprets Jesus's actions in light of the prophecy of Isaiah about justice being brought to the nations, not through force or power or imposition, but in ways that are resistant to further harming those who are identified by the prophet as a bruised reed or as a smoldering wick. This passage from Matthew is an old friend for me. Scripture was very much at the center of my life growing up, and I remember this short set of verses distinctly. In studying this gospel, I was struck by the association that Matthew makes between Jesus's ministry, especially his healing ministry, and what ultimately results as being justice, but not through the imposition of force or power, but through humility and care for those who are bruised and struggling. At the time, I found myself wondering things like, doesn't justice come through power? You know, like a strong ruler who requires obedience to what is right? And wasn't the messianic king hoped for in the prophetic literature supposed to set the record straight by subjugating enemies, by enforcing the kingdom of God, you know, by winning? So what was going on in these texts in what seemed like a different way, another way of bringing justice to victory? And I was further confused because Matthew quotes Isaiah to explain what Jesus did, and that bothered me. Now, let me explain what I mean. First, I was and still am a big believer in the view that context matters for interpretation. In this case, historical, cultural, literary context matter. And as an interpreter, I should try as much as I can to hear the biblical text as the early audiences would have heard it. As much as possible, I should try to put myself in their shoes. And while this is never perfect and it can never be fully accomplished, I can still try and gain helpful insights from interpretation as a result. Now, I certainly grew up with the view of Jesus being the fulfillment of Hebrew Bible prophecies of the coming messianic king, of the rider on the white horse who would win the battle over evil as depicted in the book of Revelation. The Jesus of my childhood and adolescence was strong, powerful, who brought justice through victory. However, this text in Matthew was not about strength or power in the traditional sense, but about another way that justice would come to victory. That is, justice is not the result or the byproduct of victory, but justice is the means of bringing about victory. In other words, justice leads to peace. 
and not the other way around. In these two biblical texts, that justice comes in a way that I had not really expected. Second, the text in Matthew is about a person, Jesus, while the text in Isaiah is about a people, Israel. The Isaiah passage is the first of four servant songs found in chapters 42, 49, 50, and 52, 53. The identity of this servant shifts over these chapters, sometimes as an individual, sometimes as the people as a whole. In this first servant song in chapter 42, the servant is the people of Israel. Matthew then applies this prophecy to the individual Jesus. I find myself wondering, how did the original reference to a group make sense when it is associated with an individual? I was used to thinking about Jesus fulfilling individual prophecies, like the Davidic covenant, for example. But Matthew's reorientation of the community text in Isaiah towards Jesus was not as clean in my mind. This was one of those moments where I realized two things. One, biblical interpretation is complicated. Can I get an amen? And two, if I wanted to understand Jesus, perhaps I should try to understand the Hebrew Bible and how the New Testament authors were using it. And the rest, as they say, is history. There were other moments and texts that changed my trajectory and interests along the way, like a course in the Minor Prophets, or reading an offhanded comment in a footnote about this odd book of Chronicles that made me quite curious. But trying to figure out how to make sense of Isaiah's servant and Matthew's Jesus was one of those first steps on a much longer personal journey. So who is the servant and what does the servant do? As I stated, Isaiah 42, the servant is Israel, the people as a collective whole. In this passage, the servant is empowered by God's spirit with the main goal of bringing justice. And notice the repetition of the word three times in the passage. The servant is to bring justice to the nations. The end of the servant's faithful work will be justice and he will establish justice in the earth. Notice also the global scope. This is not justice only for Israel. Instead, the servant, Israel, is supposed to bring justice for all. This aligns with God's proclamation that Israel is later given as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, in order to open the eyes of the blind and to liberate the prisoners. As, noticed previously, as noted previously, this end result is accomplished without force and not trampling over those who are in precarious situations. The servant does not break the bruised reed and does not quench the dimly burning wick. These metaphors likely refer to the Judeans of the prophet's day, whether those battered by the experience of exile or those who are marginalized within the contemporary society in light of reference to the blind and those who are imprisoned. There's a physicality shown both in the Isaiah text and the Matthew text. The reference are first to physical circumstances and physical healings. Justice is not merely an abstract concept or only about spiritual concerns. Justice has physical, material, and concrete ramifications. In these texts, shalom, peace, wholeness, results from justice, but justice without force, without exercising power, and without oppression that instead, instead tends to the broken, bruised, hurting, and marginalized, bringing liberation and healing as a result. So in my view, these texts express one example of active pacifism. Other interpreters agree. For example, in the, chap in the chapter on nonviolence in his excellent book, Neglected Voices, Peace in the Old Testament, Brother and Pastor David Leiter discusses this Isaiah 42 text as one of five selected examples of nonviolence in the Hebrew Bible. On chapter 42, Leiter states, quote, the rebuilding and restoration of Judah will come about by means of peace and nonviolence. Avoiding war and violence opens the door for alternatives such as those proposed by the calling of the servant, end quote. But it's not just brethren who are seeing nonviolence in this Isaiah text. Paul Hansen, a Lutheran and longtime professor at Harvard Divinity School, provides several insights into this Isaiah passage in his interpretation series commentary on Isaiah 40 through 66, easily my favorite and go-to commentary on Isaiah, highly recommended. Hansen states, quote, the manner in which God intended the servant to carry out the task of bringing forth justice to the nations stands emphatically in contrast to the manner of conflict and raw force. He then asks, quote, is it possible that the reign of justice can be promoted by submission and the express renunciation of force 
even by special attention and care to fellow victims who are on the edge of collapse and death. Hansen then concludes, quote, the servant does not cry out when, when oppressed, does not move through the streets calling for pity, does not push aside the weak in the hope of winning conventional power to his cause. The servant rather bears witness with quiet, gentle patience, confident that the nations will be drawn to God's reign of justice, not by the dint of human force, but by the attraction to embodied compassion and righteousness. Hansen contrasts the compassionate servant who brings justice nonviolently with the common methods the kings use uh, of raw force to impose what ultimately is an incomplete and insufficient justice. This servant, and by extension Jesus, operate in active pacifism, refusing force, refusing power, and instead are presented in Hansen's words as embodied compassion and righteousness, especially towards the weak and vulnerable in society in nonviolent ways. The Jesus that we see repeatedly in the Gospels certainly fits this description, whether in his healings, his teachings, his expressions of forgiveness, his being moved by compassion, or his offering of mercy, kindness, and hope. This was the Jesus that I wanted to understand better. This Jesus challenged my notions of how the kingdom of God would be made manifest, not by power or imposition, but with concern for the marginalized and the vulnerable. This Jesus demonstrated another way of living, and it was this Jesus that I've been drawn to and inspired by in my own theological and spiritual journey for several decades. The same nonviolent act of pacifism is reflected in the clips from Doctor Who that you saw earlier. While science fiction often contains violence, sometimes a lot of violence, and commonly employs redemptive violence, Doctor Who exhibits repeatedly the primacy of nonviolence and what could reasonably be termed active pacifism. Since its first episode back in 1963, the Doctor has rejected violence, especially in the context of war. Diplomacy, negotiation, nonviolence, and creativity in resolving conflicts consistently characterize the Doctor's approach. Further, the themes of forgiveness, mercy, hope, justice for the oppressed and suffering, critiquing those in power are emphasized in episodes that are far too numerous to list and by each of the currently 13 incarnations of the character known as the doctor. The brief clips shown today are a small illustration of these values and ethics as expressed by the 12th doctor played by Peter Capaldi. The very first short clip for me encapsulates three main themes reiterated over the nearly six decades of the show. The doctor is always unarmed, often stands alone, and professes that no one should ever be afraid or act out of fear. We see the doctor resist violence as a means to an end, but also persist even when others do not join the cause. Sometimes, Others will join us in our stand for what's right, but sometimes we may find ourselves without much company, especially when we're engaged in active pacifism. Even in such situations, we cannot give in to fear, fear of loss or rejection or mistreatment, and we must stand firm in our resolve, even when, and perhaps especially when, it's not easy. The second part of the clip is a short segment of a much longer 10 minute poignant sequence commonly known as the war speech which addresses war directly, the horrors of war, and the need for negotiation and peaceful resolution to conflict. In this small excerpt of that larger discourse, the doctor emphasizes the importance of forgiveness in moving forward if there is to be a chance for peace. The cycle of violence and vengeance can be broken when forgiveness is both extended and received. This is not done through power, but through relinquishing it and through vulnerability and acceptance. It is done in recognizing those who would be classified as bruised reeds and dimly burned wicks and doing them no further harm in extending forgiveness and working towards peace. The third clip sees the 12th doctor in dialogue with two incarnations of his longtime nemesis, the master or Missy simultaneously. They happen to be there at the same time. The doctor is planning to delay the impending attack by a large number of the dangerous Cybermen against a small group of humans, mostly women and children, so that they can escape. The doctor may not survive, but this is not about winning. It's about doing what is right, what is decent, what is kind, even when it doesn't work, because as the doctor says, it's just kind. 
The doctor is motivated by compassion, kindness, and concern for those who cannot defend themselves. The doctor is willing to risk personal safety on behalf of others, to stand in the way, even alone, so others can survive. Such a decision by the doctor is consistent with taking active pacifism seriously. In the final clip, before the regeneration of the 12th doctor into the 13th doctor, Capaldi's doctor gives some advice for the next version who is soon to appear and carry on being the doctor. So this is sort of his last words. The words, I think, speak for themselves. Never be cruel, never be cowardly. Hate is always foolish. Love is always wise. Laugh hard, run fast, be kind. The 12th Doctor leaves the audience not just with some memorable phrases or sage advice to ponder, but ethics and values to live by that are, that are a means of bringing about a better world, a more just world for everyone so that all may flourish. The primacy of nonviolence and active pacifism in Doctor Who resonates with the same principles that are found in the Hebrew Bible text, like Isaiah 42 and in the New Testament, especially as witnessed in the person of Jesus. Active pacifism is the faithful, nonviolent way of bringing forth justice to victory for all peoples, and especially for those who need compassion and kindness in the midst of difficult circumstances and marginalized status. And it is to this vision that we are called as we continue the mission of the servant and the work of Jesus. May we be found faithful in living out that calling. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Loving God, through whom all things are made possible, we place before you the concerns that are on our hearts and our prayers for forgiveness and healing. Friends, let us gather together in silent, prayerful, in silent prayer. And from the silence, I encourage you to offer your prayers so that we may hold them together collectively as one body. <laughs> Gracious God, hear our heartfelt prayers. Please welcome our guest singers, Susie Ndanye and Don Otoni Wilhelm. And as you're able, please stand and hum along to hymn number 403 in your hymnal while Susie and Dawn sing verses 1, 2, and 3. Sisters and brothers, as we prepare to go from this place today, I thought I'd take the opportunity to offer advice from another more contemporary prophet, John Woolman. His words are in the bulletin, and if you would please follow along with me 
uh, as I read. Where people are sincerely devoted to follow Christ and dwell under the influence of the Holy Spirit, their stability and firmness through divine blessing is at times like dew on the tender plants around about them and the weightiness of their spirits secretly works on the minds of others. Gracious God, the hope of all in need, pour your spirit upon us that we may be instruments of your justice and compassion, a light to all nations and a living promise of your new heaven and your new earth. And all God's people say, amen. Friend, go from this place today with love and forgiveness on your heart and sustained by Christ, be the dew on the tender plant and bruise no reeds. Thank you very much for being here today. I invite you to remain seated while the postlude plays and afterward, uh, before grabbing your box lunches and enjoying lunch with your friends. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. Peace and blessings to you all.